Pointy End. I'm Keith Sutherland. Today my guest is Federal Member for Bendigo, Lisa Chesters. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you, Keith. It's great to be back on the show. Been a while and it's been a tumultuous couple of weeks with lots and lots of things going on. And I have to start off with um, something that Dennis brought up on our Head to Head program yesterday that um, the Labor Party seemed to be misbehaving himself with 393 members of parliament kicked out um, as opposed to seven from the Liberal side. Does that mean that you're a pretty unruly lot or does that mean there's a bit of bias going on? It's a bit of bias, but it's also a bit of a demonstration about how bad question time is. Um, it's frustration, it's a game, and it's actually the worst hour of parliament. And the moment the cameras are turned off, it's a very different place. So uh, yes, the speaker is biased and is very quick to kick people out. Um, a few times that I've been kicked out, I have not even been, like I've just been literally sitting there reading um, my notes for the speech that I'm about to give. Um, the speaker does actually struggle with names. So one day she was looking at Catherine King, the member for Ballarat, and said the member for Bendigo will remove herself under 94A. And Catherine sits down on the front bench and I'm up in the back bench. And then she got quite surprised when I stood up and had to leave the chamber and everybody broke out laughing because she'd clearly got the wrong calls. So, but to be fair to the speaker, question time is pretty rowdy and it would be hard for anybody to concentrate on names in that forum. I noticed that, um, and we'll get on to other things, but mm. I just noticed that there's lots more Dorothy Dixes. I know mm. they've always been there, but now the ministers don't seem to answer any questions and I see the frustration on Tony mm. Burke from your side mm. trying to get answers on mm. um, things that the ministers should be talking about. Really simple, to-the-point questions and we can't get answers on them. What's worth with the Dorothy Dixes is they're the same questions they ask themselves day in, day out and really open-ended. And that is what disappoints people. Like our democracy is supposed to be robust. Regardless of who's in parliament, it's supposed to be about asking questions, questions without notice about policy that is radically changing um, Australia as we know it. And people want to know from the minister the different impacts legislation or proposals will have. It's only fair, it's how our Westminster system works. Coming back to legislation, and um, Tony Abbott said the other day that the last two weeks has been the best time for the Liberal Party because there's a lot of legislation gone through. And the Labor Party have supports them, and I just want to quote this. Mm -hmm. Joe Hockey said that the um, Labor Party have been mugged by reality. Has he got a point? What he's saying is that you've had to change your mind on several issues, and um, now you've, the reality is really heading home. Oh, it's more of um, some terrible spin by the government. Um, we, the position we changed ourselves on was in relation to the fuel excise, increasing the fuel excise. Labor voted against that when it came to the House after the last budget. It's been sitting in the Senate stalling. But what the government did was asked the petrol companies to increase the petrol tax. So we've already been paying extra in petrol tax. And if the government didn't, if the parliament didn't accept that increase in petrol tax, um, by a certain period of time, then the government would have had to have hand that money back to the petrol companies. So it was more that Labor, it wasn't, it was more that Labor went, well, we want to see that money actually go to communities and road users rather than, and to motorists, rather than it go back to the petrol companies. So it was in many ways the government being dodgy and blackmailing the parliament to agree to their legislation. It's not about reality, it's just dealing with the cold hard facts that what do you do when a government's blackmailed the parliament in that way? They shouldn't have been collecting the tax without the approval of the parliament, but they did. What do you do when you're in opposition? Try and make the most of that and at least get the money going back to road users through the roads recovery program. Um, Social Services Minister Scott Morrison said also that um, the Greens are the ones that um, particularly on some of the, um, the pensions and things mm. like this. And I noticed you've been very vocal on Facebook, Twitter, etc., talking about that. But um, uh, even though Tony Abbott said we'd never accept the vote from the Greens, but they did on this issue. Mm. And um, that's why they're saying the legislation that the Labor Party is sort of behind, getting behind some of these things and really not having the reality mm. of what's going on. And on the part pensions, I believe the Greens made a mistake on that. That was a bad policy decision. The Greens said that they supported the government's proposal to cut part pensions because it's what John Howard brought in many, many years ago. Well, life has changed a lot since John Howard was Prime Minister. The cost of living, the, the cost of having uh, your household budget has increased significantly. 
everybody knows that the cost of the basics have gone up. So these reforms targeted all part pensioners and saw a number of people who get a small part pension significantly worse off, up to about $9,000 a year worse off. So I don't agree that pushing part pensioners into poverty is fair. And so that's why um, Labor and people like myself voted against removing um, um, cutting the part pension. The Greens just purely and simply went for the, well, we didn't like it when John Howard brought it in, didn't even go out and talk to part pensioners or to the industry super funds to see who it would affect and just went, well, we didn't like it in the past, so we don't like it today. That's lazy politics. That's not actually talking to the people who it, most, who it will affect the most and finding out how their life circumstances have changed over the past two decades. Well, the thing about that that I found quite distasteful was that, yes, we'll have put super on the agenda, but Tony Abbott said there's no changes to super. I know that... Um, mm. Your shadow treasurer has come out with a policy in regards to super, etc. Mm. But the point was that they said, oh, yeah, the, the government mm. will talk about super. But in actual fact, they're not talking about super. He acknowledged that. Mm. So, yeah, I just found that whole piece of legislation quite crazy. And really frustrating to Australian people, particularly if they're getting close to retirement. When we talk about retirement income, we need to talk about everything, not just pensions or part pensions, but we also need to talk about super. We also need to talk about where we'll be um, in five years, 10 years and 30 years time. So super is taking a generation for working people to get enough super to retire on. So it's when my generation retires we hope that most people will have enough super to retire on. Until we get to that point of the 30-somethings retiring, the government needs to acknowledge that there'll be people who need part pension, part super to have enough to live on. And what I find really frustrating is that I'm one of the youngest MPs in the parliament saying, hang on a minute, we need to look at retirement over a lot of someone's working lifetime and will they have enough to retire on? Fair enough. Now, Troy Brent's Bramston um, from the Australian Opinion said, the killing season may be over, but Shorten's winter of discontent is just beginning. Is that a fair assessment? Because Bill Shorten really didn't have too good a fortnight. Lots of pressure, lots of back downs on the issues. And um, obviously with the um, Royal Commission, he's got to appear. And it's good that he is pushing forward to mm. um, appear in late July, I think it is. Mm. But has he got a point? Because he did have probably a couple of bad weeks, I would have thought. Look, I think that some of the journalists, what they loved about the killing season was they loved the political drama. I think that for some of the journalists in Canberra, uh, you know, it's a bit like watching the house, um, you know, the House of Cards. They just loved the drama, the political drama, um, and would like to see another period of that. Um, that's disappointing because Parliament's actually not about entertainment. It's actually about governing. It's actually about delivering good policy, good government um, for our community. Um, Bill Shorten is the opposition leader and I believe, I believe he'll lead Labor to the next election. Uh, he'll get the chance before the Royal Commission to sort of um, answer a number of the accusations. But just some of them, just to touch on very briefly, it's no secret to anybody that union members pay union dues. Um, some people pay them through payroll deduction, where the company collects the money and hands it over to the union. Some people pay through direct debit, where the employee pays directly to the union. You know, to sensationalise that and say, you know, AWU gets a windfall of, you know, $40,000. Well, that's just the company collecting the union dues through payroll deduction. So it's a space where this is just purely and simply a political witch hunt of their political opponent. It's $80 million that could have been spent on so many other things for our community. It could have been spent on our schools, on our roads. Um, it could have been spent on actually chasing the super that people may not have received from companies who've gone under. Like if you want to talk about genuine workplace support and reform, it could have gone to small businesses to help them with Fair Work Australia. Like there was a better way to spend $80 million. It's a very expensive witch hunt against your political opponent. It was interesting also with the Prime Minister having, um, when the killing season was over, um, complimenting the um, ABC then two weeks later when the Q&A program comes, castigating the ABC, so it just depends on which side of politics you're sitting at that point in time. And didn't he look like a fool when he did that? Like you can't say that you support the independence of the ABC on one day and then on the other day say, how dare you be independent? Like it's just not right. And Australians see straight through that. People love 
they're independent broadcasters. They like their local media, they respect their local media, but they don't expect it to be a propaganda arm for the government.